I'm Jen Straley. I'm one of the Pease neurosurgeons here at WashU. Thank you all so much for coming tonight. I heard a lot of you traveled from quite a far distance. Um, and I'll be talking tonight, there's a little bit of overlap with a few, of, uh, a few things that Jared talked about. Um, it's amazing how far we've come, I think, in the research community, both in partnering with organizations like Bobby Jones um, and also in the research over the last like 15, 20 years. Um, when I started uh, in the carrier world uh, about 15 years ago, um, there really wasn't a lot known about basic information like prevalence, natural history. And actually, the first part of this talk, uh, as I was putting this together, I sort of went through my old Chiari talks, and I have a talk from 2009 that says redefining Chiari malformation. And so it's really great to see things come full circle where we were finally able to get really large and you know a large NIH grant to study this. So it's it's a lo lot of exciting things. But I did want to just touch upon um, the the, the um, area of Chiari that I see in a day-to-day -day basis in clinic that doesn't always pertain to the kids that come in and clearly need surgery. It's the folks that come in that have had debilitating symptoms for many months or years and then have a diagnosis of Chiari, and the question is, how do we proceed? How do we manage this? Um, and recently, we've done uh, a deeper dive into understanding patient and family perspectives and how we can partner together to improve the care of Chiari. Um, so no disclosures, I recently completed a term on the Bobby Jones uh, Chiari and Singer Malia Foundation Scientific Education Advisory Board. Um, it's a mouthful. Um, so <laughs> do have a, uh, you know, uh, I, I know everyone went quite well and I'm happy that we're all here today. Um, so just an example case presentation. This is just, you know, a fictitious patient, but um, uh, many of the presentations occur like this. Um, so a seven-year-old could be a boy or girl presents with headaches and an MRI of the brain is obtained. What happens typically initially with the diagnosis, and I'm sure many of you can remember back to when you first got that diagnosis and how you felt and, and maybe some anxiety or unknowns about, um, about that word Chiari. Um, so what I see is parents receive a report in my chart or, you know, get a message from their doctor stating that their MRI report says carry one malformation. Um, the word malformation is there, and so that also, you know, has, has some, can cause, cause some anxiety. This family follows up with their pediatrician who refers the child to a neurosurgeon. Um, typically, you know, appointments aren't, you know, sometimes take a couple weeks uh, to get into the neurosurgeon, and what happens during that time? Um, a lot of patients go to the internet, and um, uh, I'm gonna touch upon that a little bit later. So um, I'm going to move through these slides a little bit more quickly, as Jared already went through the anatomy, so we don't have to review that. Um, but what I wanted to focus on is in the, in the radiology report, um, the radiologist is making this determination of care on malformation based on this five millimeter rule. Um, imaging, this is a pneumoencephalogram um, from back in the day. Um, prior to MRI, and only patients with severe, severe symptoms were um, being diagnosed with Chiari. Um, more recently, we have newer, newer imaging techniques like MRI, which Jared detailed um, uh, very well in his talk, which I won't get into. Um, so where did this five millimeters come from? Um, there were two studies, actually one of which was from here, um, around 1985, and this tracks well with uh, the advent of the MRI we had in uh, 1981, I believe Jared mentioned. A few years later, uh, groups were able to uh, assess Chiari patients, and two groups around the same time came up with this five millimeter cut point. Um, the studies were small, so the first study, there were 13 patients with Chiari, and the second, second study, there were 25 patients with Chiari. So really small numbers. However, this stuck, and this remains to this day, many years later, this five millimeters, and we're trying to get away from that and in this you know, re redefining Chiari, but as I think you asked, <laughs> is this still being used? It is, and we're trying to change that, but it, it does give us a general you know, marker of, of low tonsil position versus a normal tonsil position. So, um, and not all carries are created equal. This is just a brief example to show that in these tonsils here, you have rounded tonsils here. They're sort of an indeterminate, um, not quite pegged, and the one on the uh, uh, screen left are pegged tonsils, all with about the same amount of tonsil descent. So. Um, there is a lot more to Chiari than just 
um, than just the five millimeters. Um, this was a study we did uh, back in 2013, um, trying to understand in the general population, what is the average tonsil position? Um, we looked at, uh, we uh, performed random sampling from 62,000 consecutive patients um, and uh, went through the decades and had a, a 300 patients uh, randomly sampled from that larger cohort of patients per decade um, and then measured uh, left tonsil, right tonsil uh, in these patients. And what you can see here, this differs from some of the earlier literature um, uh, that uh, the, so we were taught, you know, when I first started residency, um, that over the lifetime there was um, th th there wasn't this dip sort of in the mid twenties, um, and that was that was based on theory, <laughs> that wasn't based on on data. So we now know that if um, so, the the graph at the top, um, tonsil position with respect to the frame and magnum is on the left, and age is on the right, and what you can see is that when you're young you have a tonsil position that is a little bit above the level of the skull base. And as you go from birth into your mid, so your mid twenties uh, up to thirties, the average tonsil position in the population gets lower. And the, at least in the adult community, I'm pediatric, so I don't, I don't see a lot, of, a lot of adults in my practice, but we see a lot of symptomatic patients in their late teens, early 20s, at least in the adult population, and a lot of that probably results from overall that group of patients having, on average, lower tonsil position. Um, I think one of the reasons for this is that the brain is continuing to really develop into your early mid-20s, and then it starts to atrophy. And so that's why you see in, you know, 70-year-old, 80-year-old, um, the tonsil position becomes uh, more cranial or, or further away. You have less of a Chiari because your brain is smaller. Um, that part is our, is, is our hypothesis as to why this occurs. We have not, you know, done brain volumetric studies, um, but that is, that is one of the possibilities to explain this data here. Um, so with that, understanding that there is some normal variation over time in tonsil position when you look at a population level, um, we then focused in on the pediatric population to understand how common is Chiari. And this study was published in 2011 and is still one of the larger pediatric studies. It was the largest at the time. Um, looking at um, four, four uh, children that have five millimeters or more of tonsil descent. So we, we chose that cut point because, you know, that was operationally what, what, you know, what most were using. And we sampled uh, 15,000 patients who had undergone MRI imaging and found that about 3.6% of children undergoing MRI imaging had tonsil position five millimeters or more. And this is the distribution on the side there. The dark bars are Chiari only, the uh, lighter bars are Chiari plus series. So 3.6%. And I've had discussions with, with some friends and also um, other parents and and this is an ongoing discussion as to what is common, what is rare. I think if it's affecting you and your family, it is not you know, made easier by saying it's common. It's, it's different for everyone, I think. Um, but I think it's important to realize that 3.6 is about one in 25 patients, or if you think about the US, about 13 million patients. So it's, it, while it is, um, you know, um, it, it's not as common as some other diseases, it's not, as rare as some others. So this is just, take it for, for, for what is the, the, these are some of the numbers that we have. Um, and importantly, from a sex differences standpoint, there's equal distribution with Chiari, male or female. So this information I think just is important to understand that it's, um, you know, it is, it is not uncommon to have tonsil position five millimeters or more. Um, when we look, um, and I wanna make sure I get to the end part there. Um, if we look at Chiari and Syrinx together, and this was the, really the beginning of multiple years of deep investigations into really thinking about how does Chiari relate to Syrinx? How does Syrinx relate to scoliosis? I don't know if, you have, if we have anyone in the room impacted by Chiari-associated scoliosis, but um, it was, this was the beginnings of, of really um, trying to understand um, at a deeper level how, how these different entities are all related. And the one thing I wanted to highlight here is that overall, syrinx is present in about 20% of patients. And that number is a bit lower from a lot of the prior surgical series where syrinx 
um, rates of syrinx and carry were reported to be as high as 70 percent, but that was in the setting of um, surgical case series. So, so we found that in fact syrinx was not as common as previously thought in the setting of Chiari. And I wanted to highlight the female um, predominance of of kids with Chiari and syrinx as well as Chiari and scoliosis. So this is an area that we're still investigating, and it's super interesting as as it relates to adolescent idiopathic scoliosis um, being predominant in females and how there may be some um, similar mechanisms at play. Um, but we found that if you have a carrying syrinx, you're um, uh, more than twice as likely to, or you're twice as likely to, ha to be female than male. So there's, there's an interesting association between carry syrinx and carry scoliosis, um, more common in females than males. So th I wanted to provide a little bit of background and let's go back to that presenting clinical, clinical vignette. Um, so that patient was presenting with headaches, and that's the most common reason Chiari is diagnosed, is through imaging obtained for the presentation of headaches. Here is a list of additional symptoms. And here is where the challenging part um, is, and, it's a, and, and I would love additional thoughts after I'll put my contact information up at the end to try to figure out how we can all work together to, to really... Um, you know, understand this relationship a little bit more. Um, when you, so you have a list of symptoms on the left, which is pretty broad, and that's just reason for imaging, and then the patients will come, many patients come with a number of other symptoms. If you look at the recent guidelines that, um, that we talked about that were mentioned earlier uh, tonight, the surgery um, is thought to improve strain-related headaches. Outside of that symptom, there are uh, many symptoms where it's unclear if surgery will make those symptoms better. And this is where the challenging part lies, is to try to understand and parse out, um, you know, which symptoms do we think are associated with Chiari, which do we think are not associated with Chiari, and how do we all work together to provide the best care for our patients and make sure that they feel supported and not, um, you know, left, left to feel alone when, when, when they're... they're what? There are others out there. Others out there, and when we say, when, when I may say, I don't think you need surgery, the family may say, well, well what, out? What, what about my symptoms? So, um, so this is a recent study we did that was published a couple months ago. We looked at patient and caregiver perceptions of Chiari. We looked through online discussion boards. We did not use identifiable discussion boards. Um, so it was a, a limitation of the study. So we did not use the Facebook groups, which I know are, many of you may be part of, and a lot of people are very active in those. Um, in terms of the study, we wanted to not use any identifiable information that could be tied to any patients, so we used um, online anonymous board posts. Um, and, and we found a similar set of symptoms that were experienced by patients with Chiari, similar to the ones we saw in our formal study. Um, uh, oh, sorry, was it a question? No. Question? No. Um, so... Here, we took all of those posts and there was a, uh, we did a thematic analysis and analyzed um, hundreds of posts. And what we found was that the general presentation algorithm was that um, someone presented to their general practitioner um, and either their symptoms were just, there they're, they're sort of th four possibilities. A diagnostic test was performed, maybe an MRI, Perhaps their symptoms were dismissed. Maybe there was a misdiagnosis or they were referred directly to a neurologist or neurosurgeon. When someone gets to a neurologist or neurosurgeon, there was a general feeling that their symptoms were either, um, uh, if, if no additional testing was performed, that the symptoms were either dismissed or misdiagnosis. Once you get to the diagnostic test performed, folks felt in general that you either had a correct diagnosis, misdiagnosis, or symptoms dismissed. But the, the symptoms being dismissed was a common, common theme that we saw um, in many of the posts. Um, um, before, um, I wanted to put this in there, um, and so before getting to the, my final sort of conclusion from that study, I wanted to, to touch on one other part. So I went through sort of the prevalence and um, how common Chiari and Syrinx is. Um, the other piece of this that I think is important when patients come to see me, 
I think if patients come and have clear symptoms, like large searing or strain-related headaches, tests of headaches that are related to the Chiari, that is, I think, you know, a, a more... Um, uh, I can tell the family with more confidence that if I do surgery, I think it's likely that either their symptoms or symptoms will get better. Um, if they come and they do, if I don't think that they initially have symptoms that are necessarily related to the carry at that time, what is reassuring is that um, uh, we published it in 2011 and there's been additional studies, other groups as well, and since then where um, we know that about 90 to 95% of patients um, don't develop new symptoms after an initial recommendation for conservative management. So this is not including the patients that come in where we think need surgery. Um, so we do think overall that the natural history of Chiari can be um, relatively benign. Um, this is an area that, that the, the numbers of patients in these studies, similar to what was mentioned before, um, the numbers are limited, so we definitely need much larger scale natural history studies. Um, uh, but this is information, at least from some of the natural history studies. Um, so I wanted to touch upon that briefly. So um, in, in um, jumping back to the con conclusion or some of the takeaways that we um, that that we got from some of those patient discussion boards were that um, that there were some opportunities to improve uh, interaction, uh, um, um, opportunities to improve the patient experience in the treatment of Chiari. So patients felt that physicians were dismissive or overlooked symptoms that could impact their quality of life, um, that patients sometimes experience multiple refer referrals for the various symptoms and don't feel like they get answers. Um, a lot of people felt like it was essential to consult with a Chiari specialist um, to ensure an accurate diagnosis. Um, and then there was, and I think this is true, I think the last one is, is very true, that there is a general uncertainty by physicians regarding optimal treatment options for individuals. Um, I think we're all here because we want to understand Chiari better. Chiari is not a single entity, and just like, you know, 15 years ago, um, the redefinition of Chiari that we were working on was related a little bit more to tonsil morphology and tonsil position. Now what we're working with to redefine Chiari is much more advanced through the advanced imaging that Jared talked about, through some of the CSF flow imaging that we're talking about. So I think we're going to get there. I think that through continued process of all working together, um, hearing your perspectives, um, doing research, thinking outside the box, we're, we're going to get there. But this uncertainty is something that is a continued opportunity for improvement. So I just wanted to acknowledge that and also thank all of you for um, just being here and your support and your interest. Um, so to end with the ongoing carry research, I think I have a few more minutes left. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the redefining carry has really, it's been um, over a decade long process and it's amazing to see that it culminated in a large um, PO1 um, uh, that, that Dave, it was, it, you know, it was a massive undertaking <laughs> um, uh, that um, it was amazing to be able to partner with him and, and he of course, you know, was the, the ultimate um, uh, lead on that, but we've worked together for many years trying to think about how best to approach Chiari, and it's been um, uh, great great to do that and involve everyone, and um, it's great to have Jared you know, as a part of that as well. Um, so um, my specific project, so there's four projects within the Redefining Chiari Malformation PO1. Um, the one that I'm leading is looking at CSF circulation. Um, thinking beyond the CSF spaces, um, these are some other ongoing carry projects that we're doing. So in the last two minutes, I have three slides left, so don't worry. Um, so the way that, the way that CSF uh, for many years was thought about, mo are most of you familiar with, with, I think most are familiar with CSF. Um, we think about it as bathing the brain and being contained within the CSF spaces. Um, this is uh, from, from a, a laboratory study, so in addition to the clinical research that we do, we also have laboratory research 
a little bit more focused in um, hydrocephalus and uh, CSF circulation. Um, what we uh, reported um, in 2023 was that we discovered that the CSF circulation in the brain during development, and this is something that's specific to development and not necessarily to adults, is that the CSF directly targets neuronal cell populations populations in the brain. So what that means, so think of this image here. These are in rats. The bright area is CSF, and this is the brain. And so CSF, this, these are the ventricles. I think most in the room may know what the ventricles are. They're the normal fluid fill spaces in the brain. Um, but the spinal fluid in CSF does not stay within the <coughs> ventricles. It, it flows through the entire brain um, and targets uh, neurons, which are important uh, cells in the brain. Um, so there's a big question of, in the setting of Chiari, so we'll go back to the um, example of some Chiari imaging, or some uh, CSF flow imaging here, um, when you have tonsils that are altering the CSF flow at the level of the frame and magnum, how does that also alter CSF interaction with the brain, and could that alter and affect downstream brain functioning like cognition and some of the functional pathways that Dr. Roland and his team are looking at um, with, with another uh, pro project within the redefining Chiari. Um, so I think the tools we have now are super exciting and the collaboration, bringing so many people together. Um, this, I think we're gonna be able to achieve really great things through the amazing collaboration we have with others at WashU, um, across disciplines, across institutions. Um, we're gonna be able to go go far um, together. Um, so we're super excited about that. Um, so next steps, we'll continue to do the research, but then I think almost more importantly and what I sort of wanted to focus on today is because I um, uh, appreciate so much all of you coming here today is that um, we need to continue to obtain perspectives from patients and families affected by Chiari and work together to develop resources and really optimize the care and patient satisfaction and continue workshops like this one, which is amazing for setting up. And Anna, just to echo what you said, um, you mentioned it's, it's an amazing um, aspect of Paraquad where you have someone that's actually lived the experience to be able to interface with the families. And so um, while I'm you know, a mom of three young daughters and I, I, can, um, you know, I, I have a, a mom perspective, I, I don't have a child with Kiari. And so um, it's important that we all partner together to, to um, see how we can best treat Kiari. Please reach out, this is my email. Twitter handle. I'm working on my Instagram to, to post more. <laughs> um, so I'm a little bit more active on X, I guess, not Twitter. Um, but please email. Happy to discuss things anytime. So. Yeah. Yeah. What is normal CSF pressure? Um, <laughs> it's a good question. Um, and how do you get it? It depends a little bit on the age. So the the textbook answer is we use similar how we use five millimeters as a cutoff, even though it's not really a cutoff. We typically use twenty millimeters of mercury as a as a general cutoff, meaning we like pressures below twenty millimeters of mercury. Above tend to be higher, but in a you know a one year old twenty would be a little bit high. What I've read everywhere, they say a bolt is the best way to. Oh, to measure. Yeah. Um, I would say pr probably, so the way to measure pressure is either a bolt, um, and there, there are some newer advances with, you know, eye, like ultrasounding of the eyes and, oh, really? and, and looking at, you know, optic nerve and extrapolating pressures that way. But the traditional ways are a bolt, ICP monitor, an external ventricular drain, which would also measure pressure, and then a lumbar puncture. The lumbar puncture's probably not as accurate, but might be lower risk. So they, they have a role, I think, in and some places. Why does atmospheric pressure mess with them so bad? So we see this a lot in our shunt patients, um, all the time. I, we don't know, but it is it is definitely there. Oh, yeah. It is definitely Especially there. <laughs> yes, yes. I know. So Even when you can tell when the weather's a little bit off, I know we're going to see, you know, more of our shunt kiddos because patients want reassurance. And, yep.